talking about esports. Um, you know, the various things that kind of pile into what it what it takes to start and run a program. Um, my name is Josh Knutson. I'm the Esports and Virtual Reality Solutions Director here at Bytespeed. Um, I'm a National Association of Esports Coaches and Directors Advisory Board member. Um, so it's a big fancy long way of saying uh, I work with the National Coaches Association on developing professional development and uh, resources for new and existing programs at all levels of play. Uh, and I'm also the former head coach program director at the University of Jamestown. Um, we started that program back in 2016. Um, and I ran that, that collegiate team uh, until May of last year uh, when I switched over to Bytespeed. Uh, my role here is uh, very much serving as a resource um, for uh, the schools that we work with, um, making sure that they kind of understand and have the knowledge they need moving forward to successfully implement esports into uh, into their schools. So um, that's a little bit about me. My contact info is here on the screen. Feel free to jot that down. Um, best way to get a hold of me right now is probably cell phone or email. Um, but I would love to connect if you have uh, questions beyond what we talk about today, or if you'd like to talk one-on-one -on -one about what you have going uh, in your school. So um, why should we care about esports? Um, you know, this is a big question that we have to ask ourselves when we look at the overall, you know, why should we implement this into our school? Why should we spend the money to create something um, that we're going to, you know, put resources towards. Um, and at the end of the day, student engagement and involvement is probably the biggest driving factor, uh, especially at the high school level uh, and absolutely at college level as well of, you know, why we want to build esports programs. Um, I've said for a long time that everyone's a gamer. Um, it doesn't matter if you are, you know, my grandma who plays Candy Crush, uh, on her phone or if you're my brother who is on the the varsity team at, at the university of jamestown and and plays hearthstone and super smash brothers um you know it, everybody plays games in some way shape or another uh, and it doesn't matter you know if you're young old man woman um it, everybody plays games so um and a lot of the times this this esports it hits an underserved group of students, um, you know, students who traditionally haven't had something to participate in, you know, after school or, or you know, as a, as a social group. Um, and, you know, developing a, a program centered around gaming, uh, a lot of the times will hit kind of the in-between. Um, you know, you have your student athletes, the, the students that are involved with sports, um, you know, they're gonna play football, basketball, baseball every year. Um, you have students that are involved in fine arts. They're gonna do theater and choir and, and things like that. Um, but but the esports kind of hits the in between, um, and it's not often you know an opportunity, especially at the high school level, for as many students to participate. And and this helps tremendously with that. Um, you know, at, at the next level, it's the newest growing sport. Um, we've seen exponential growth in the high school and college level um, in the last 10 years, uh, you know, starting with the high school star league back in 2010, uh, all the way up to, you know, right now with groups like play versus, um, you know, high school esports league, the individual state groups out there at the college level, you know, the national association of collegiate esports, TESPA, riot, the National Junior College Athletic Association, tons and tons of groups have made the commitment to creating a new sport that is sanctioned and played just like, you know, your traditional sports like basketball or baseball or football. Um, you know, there's something like 170 plus schools, and it's probably actually closer to 200 plus varsity level collegiate programs that offer scholarships and things like that. Um, and, you know, double that at the club level. So there's a ton of opportunity to participate past high school. Uh, and like I said, the, the high school numbers, you know, broken out between the various leagues that are out there in the individual states uh, is in like the thousands as far as the number of schools that are participating. 
Um, you know, I talked a little bit about the scholarship opportunities, you know, with the varsity programs and even some of the club teams out there. Um, the average national scholarship, um, you know, if you take a, a big list and look at what the average is, is $4,600 a year per student. Um, that's an incredible number for some, for some kids. Um, you know, there's universities out there that are offering full rides. There are schools that um, have no scholarships. But, you know, if you look at the varsity level programs, there's a ton of opportunity for our seniors in high school to earn a scholarship and get a really high quality education while following their passion with esports through, you know, something like a scholarship. Um, teams at the collegiate level usually have between 25 and 40 players, um, sometimes more. So if you do a little quick math here, um, you know, $4,600 a year times uh, 40 players is, you know, something absurd, like $184,000 per team given out in scholarship dollars. Um, and that's just if we take the average. So it's, it's a great opportunity for our students, especially our high schoolers, uh, to continue along. Um, the different games that are out there uh, that are played kind of in both high school and college, it varies dramatically uh, based on kind of what you're looking at. Um, by far, League of Legends is, is the most popular out of any title out there. Um, it's, you know, a 10-year-old esport that has tremendous uh, following because it's free for one, um, which is a great asset. Um, low barrier to entry, especially for schools, you know, if we're talking about low income districts that, that don't have a ton of money to spend on extra things. Uh, League of Legends is a great game to start with um, and it is massively popular. Uh, Overwatch, Hearthstone, Super Smash Brothers, the list goes on and on. At the end of the day, uh, the important thing to know about the, the titles out there is that it, if, if you have a student who's playing a game, chances are there's a, a competitive scene for it. So what does eSports coaching look like? How do we actually run these programs? Um, it, it's very similar to traditional sports. Um, you know, you're doing things like game planning and scouting. Um, you know, you're looking at drills for your players to improve. You're looking at goal setting and player development. Uh, and you're also doing in-game coaching. Um, a lot of the uh, misconceptions about esports are that, you know, we're just sitting in a basement playing video games. Uh, you know, or we're staying, sitting in a computer lab after school and, you know, we're playing playing video games. Um, but it's actually much deeper than that. Um, you know, you walk into a, an esports facility and you watch a team practice. It's very similar to watching a basketball team practice, except for the fact that, you know, instead of a basketball and a hoop, we have a mouse and a keyboard. Um, you know, your coaches are doing the same types of student interactions that you would see in any traditional sport. Um, you know, when you game plan, you're going to go ahead and create a, the best strategy to defeat your opponent. Um, you're going to go and scout out their previous games, look at their strategies and how you can counter them. Uh, and you're looking at goal setting and player development. Like I said, you know, how do we get our students better at the game, but also, you know, better in their personal lives? Um, one of the great benefits of esports, and this is true for traditional sports as well, is that those students that are involved in this activity are often, you know, succeeding elsewhere in school. You know, their grades are improving, their attendance is improving, um, you know, we're seeing less truancy. Um, it gives them kind of like a carrot on a stick to go for in the terms of, you know, a lot of these programs have academic eligibility requirements. So, you know, if I don't have a 2.5 GPA or whatever it might be, I don't get to play. All of a sudden that means that, you know, I'm gonna try harder in math and I'm gonna, you know, work to, to get that paper in on time so that I, I receive full marks for it. Um, and it's a great way to improve um, outside of the game, but having these added benefits that we see with, with participating in the team overall. And, you know, the last bit here, this in-game coaching and kind of what that looks like, um, you know, 
you're having shot calls being made, um, much like calling plays. They're interacting with their players at a, a very intimate moment when competition is on the line. And it's really cool to see the parallels between traditional sports and, uh, and esports in a lot of these similar ways. Um, so as far as necessities go, um, you know, in, in building programs and, and in coaching a team, um, there's a couple of different software out there that I would really highly recommend. Um, Discord, for example, is a team communications platform. Um, it's great for instant messaging. You can post announcements. You can um, create schedules uh, and be able to communicate with your students. Um, we used it for everything from posting our, our weekly practice plan on Saturdays. Uh, when I was uh, at the University of Jamestown, we would once a week create next week's practice plan posted in our discord saying, you know, okay, on Monday, our, our League of Legends team is going to do this. On Tuesday, our, our Overwatch team is going to do, you know, we're going to have this scrimmage or, you know, so on and so forth. Um, it's also used for that in-game communication. So, you know, with esports, you're going to be sitting at a PC, you're going to have a headset on, uh, and you're going to need to communicate with your teammates. And uh, Discord allows you to do that without um, running too much on the, on the hardware requirements. Um, so you can run in the background and not affect your gameplay. And it gives you an environment to be able to, to talk with your team uh, and talk about strategy and, and call plays and things like that. Um, you know, Google Docs, it might seem like a no brainer or a, a kind of a, um, you know, you know, something that you should already be using uh, when you're coaching, but I, it's something that a lot of times gets looked over uh, and it could be any, any, you know, scheduling or, or online environment to hold documents, um, you know, sharing a practice plan with your players or sharing schedules in like an Excel table or something like that. Um, we used to use Google Docs for like our game planning. I would create folders for every team that we played and, and post things there. Um, you can use it very much like a Google Classroom if you wanted to. Um, and there's a great flexibility with something that's online and you can collaborate with um, not only yourself, but your students adding to um, those sources of information. Social media is huge. Um, you know, as far as, as esports is concerned, there's a ton of different platforms out there, but, but Twitter and Twitch are kind of the two big ones, especially at the high school level. Um, you know, you're looking at things like how, how do we actually view content for esports? Um, you know, I can look up Fargo South's football schedule and say, okay, we're playing Fargo North on Friday at seven o'clock. I can drive to the football field. I can pay attendance. I can show up uh, and watch the game. Um, for esports, there's not really a in-person spectator environment that's super common um, for, for all the schools that are participating. So where do we actually watch our, our high schools play? Where do we view that content? Um, that'd be something like an online streaming platform like Twitch or YouTube or Mixer or, or you know, those are kind of the three main ones. Facebook gaming even is, is starting to, to move forward in the live streaming aspect. Um, so we, you know, jump on those live stream platforms and actually watch and interact with our teams in, in the chat. Um, much like, you know, you guys are watching this webinar and have the ability to type out questions and interact with one another through, through the text chat, you can do that through Twitch. Uh, and it's a great way to get other people involved um, on a much larger scale than just, you know, the six or seven players that are in your, in your computer lab. Uh, and, you know, Twitter and any social media, Instagram, Facebook, what have you, um, that's a great way to showcase what your team is up to. It's a great way to network with other high school programs or other college programs. Um, you know, a lot of networking and a lot of the uh, extra information is posted on Twitter. And a lot of high school teams have created Twitter accounts to be able to connect with, with other schools. Um, you know, I got direct messages as a coach saying, Hey, you know, we have this player who's looking to uh, continue playing in college. You know, would you consider speaking with him or recruiting him? Um, you know, it's a great way to connect with other people. Uh, and the vast majority of 
the professional world in esports lives on Twitter and, and kind of posts updates and posts game results and things like that there. Uh, so how do I get started? Um, this is, you know, another huge question and probably uh, what a lot of you are, are thinking about here um, is, you know, what do I need to actually go from ground zero to, you know, having a program in my school competing every week? Um, and the first thing that I would say is, you know, look at the goals for your program. Um, I think one of the biggest shortfalls and the biggest um, thing that holds a lot of schools back is that they rush into creating a program without a clear goal in mind. Um, and that goal can be anything from retention to winning games um, to, you know, student involvement or anything in between. Um, you know, but I think it's really, really important to have a clear vision and a, a clear goal about where you're headed. Um, and, you know, not rushing into things just because the school down the road has a program or started a program this summer, um, I think will will pay off dividends in the end. Um, and you'll have more student buy in right away if the expectations and the goals are set from day one. Um, so once you have a goal, you can start taking a look at facilities. Um, you know, you'll want to address the internet and power concern right off the bat. Um, a couple of notes about this though, um, eSports PCs, uh, because a majority of the competition happens on a, on a PC, um, most gaming computers nowadays are super power efficient. Um, and you won't have to worry too much about the power concern. Um, as long as your IT staff is consulted early on, that's uh, usually not something that you'll have to worry about. Same goes for internet. Um, you know, you'll want to do things like check for the ability to be a wired connection over Wi-Fi, um, you know, performance wise and just the, the overall experience is going to be way, way better on a wired connection than something like Wi-Fi. Um, just because a Wi-Fi network is less stable um, and you can oftentimes get better um, connection speeds over, you know, a more secured connection. Um, you don't have to go overkill on your internet. Um, you know, I ran a collegiate program where we had 24 PCs in our facility, um, all on one network. And it was a hundred meg connection um, for the first two years. Uh, so not a lot as far as what, what bandwidth is concerned. I mean, I have like a 50 meg connection at home um, with one computer. So um, not much bigger than, you know, your standard at home internet for 24 machines at a varsity level college program. Um, you know, with that came its challenges. Um, you know, you have to manage your updates when um, each week when the when the games come through and, and there's a League of Legends patch every single week on Tuesday or Thursday, um, you know, you're going to look and say, okay, if we have a gig update that we have to do on 15 machines and I have this, you know, smaller internet connection, maybe we need to do this during off hours or, you know, before practice instead of having the kids start up the launcher and, and boot things when they come in at 3.30 and then all of a sudden you have 20 machines that need to update and you're sitting there for a half an hour while your internet updates um, instead of being able to jump into practice right away and, and utilizing that time. Um, so we had to manage our updates with that smaller internet connection, but it was doable. Um, if you can separate that traffic from the rest of your, the school, that's oftentimes a, a big asset and a lot of schools will do that, either create a separate VLAN or something like that to, um, you know, get the esports traffic off of the regular network um, that the rest of the devices at school are connected to. Um, or, you know, they're, the other thing that you can keep in mind is that a lot of the times eSports practice happens after the rest of school is out. So if you have a slower connection or a smaller connection, um, you know, you might not have the 400 devices walking around the school um, connected to the internet like you would when class is in session with, you know, phones or tablets or Chromebooks or, you know, whatever you have. A lot of the times those will be turned off at 3.30 when everybody goes home. So the, the network constraints on the machines that you're playing eSports on will be much, much less. Um, this is a great place to 
to look at in like year two or three, uh, if you have extra budget dollars increasing your bandwidth or, uh, you know, getting a little bit more out of your internet, it's a great thing to look at down the road, but it is manageable um, right off the bat. How many PCs do you buy? This is the other big facilities question, right? Uh, and it kind of is a two part answer. Um, you have to look at what the minimum requirement just for the game that you're gonna play is. Um, so if we're gonna play League of Legends, that's a five on five game, I need five computers. Um, Overwatch is six on six, we'll need six. Now that's the bare minimum. Um, you know, you can look at things like, okay, do I want full five on five scrimmage practice? Um, you know, much like in basketball practice, you have your five starters, play your five subs in practice and, and compete against each other and scrimmage against each other um, to get better. If you want to do something like that for esports, which a lot of programs do, um, you'll need to, to double that five or that six, depending on what you're playing. Um, the good news is that there is not an esport that exists right now that is more than six on six. And the majority of titles are five on five or less. Um, Rocket League is three on three, for example. And that's probably the second most popular title in high school. Um, and it's also massively popular in college. Um, Overwatch is a first person shooter game. So your school might not be comfortable letting um, you compete in a title like that. Super common, not a big deal. That means, you know, you only need to have five as your bare minimum. Uh, and now I need 10 instead of 12 for that kind of five on five inner squad practice. Um, specs on the PC can vary. Um, what I will say is that a lot of the times there's this um, mix up between esports and gaming, uh, and there is a difference. Um, you know, when I talk about gaming in its very traditional sense, it's that first person, really highly immersive. Um, you know, think of like games like Skyrim or, or something that's really, really, you know, meant for one person and it pushes the graphics to the nth degree. Um, you know, that's gaming uh, and requires oftentimes a lot more on the hardware side of things than esports. Um, you know, the titles that we're competing in in esports in that multiplayer competitive environment uh, are oftentimes optimized for lower spec machines. Um, now, you know, there's this joke in the community that you can play e League of Legends on a toaster. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's true to a point, uh, but there is kind of thresholds that you, that you should meet um, moving from game to game to game. Um, you know, League of Legends is, is less intensive on your system than a lot of titles. Uh, but if you're going to compete in things like Rocket League or Rainbow Six Siege or Overwatch or games where frame rate and, um, you know, other performance factors really, really matter. And the difference is, you know, if skill is equal on both sides, but my machine on the left is, you know, a five-year-old, you know, brick that we pulled out of this existing computer lab. And then side B is a brand new, you know, esports built machine. The advantage is going to go to the better computer. Um, if you go to bitespeed.com, we have kind of like our entry level builds uh, and Tierney Brothers has these as well uh, in, a, in a nice catalog based on what type of game you're looking at playing. We have a different system configuration that kind of matches up best performance for, you know, Rocket League or best performance for just League of Legends. Uh, and there's certainly upgrades that go along with that. But I think the, the one word of caution I'll, I'll say is that, you know, if a Civic works, you don't need to spend money on a Ferrari. Uh, and that's kind of goes for, for all of esports when you're looking at machines, furniture, mice, keyboards. Um, you don't have to overspend to have a really high quality product. Okay, so we've talked about a goal. We have a facility. 
now we need a place to play. So you're going to look for a governing organization. Um, and this is things like, you know, if you've heard of Play Versus before, um, they're a group that works uh, with the National Federation of High Schools and the State Activities Association to actually sanction esports at the high school level and create it as a state sport, um, just like football or baseball or, or whatever your traditional sport is. Um, and they have their own season information and rules and regulations, um, you know, you could do play versus there's the high school esports league out there. Um, you know, there's NASAF, there's individual state groups like esports, Ohio, um, Wisconsin, independent esports, um, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, you know, those are the kind of like those grassroots leaders that are creating statewide organizations um, that you can play under uh, and will be kind of like your place for competition. Uh, and now we've just got a couple of photos in here um, uh, that were sent to us from uh, one of our play versus contacts of uh, just like an early high school club. Um, and you see on here, these rooms that they're in look like computer labs. I mean, you don't have to build this giant $100,000 facility to really get good student buy-in uh, and a lot of opportunities to grow socially and emotionally. Um, you know, it's a tremendous opportunity to, to get students involved in large, large numbers. Um, you know, I talked about how collegiate teams at the varsity level are often between 25 and 40 students. High school, you can double that and still be safe. Um, you know, it, it's a great opportunity for a lot of kids to get involved and, and have a great time. Um, so then I just have a quick little video here and then I'm going to open it up for questions. I know this is a pretty short presentation and covers kind of the high level conversations of like what esports is at a very general sense, but I do want to leave open quite a bit of time here for questions if there is any um, to kind of go back and forth. Um, but I'm going to just see if this works here. I don't know if we have sound. Let's see. I am a computer science and IT double major, which I think ties in really well with some of the like, collegiate esports in general. How we talk about the specs of PCs or just learning more uh, as to how we play or like how a unit kind of works. I don't have a specific occupation in mind. I just know that I want to go into something computer science related because oh, I love computers. We look for a, a number of things when we're looking to award scholarships to our players. They need to be willing to put in the work for the betterment of the team, even if they're you know, a superstar. We also look for good communication skills, just that drive to get better. It just seems so appealing to be able to do something that I like doing without my parents complaining about it. They had no idea you get a scholarship from playing video games. Choosing to pursue collegiate esports over some of the traditional sports was kind of a decision that was because of physical toll. I actually have pretty weak knees because I triple jump and long jump for the track team, and that's pretty difficult on the on the body. Our partnership with Gravity Gaming just improved our whole situation. Words can't even describe it. One of the best decisions we ever made was going with Gravity. They care about our success as much as we do. I think the opportunity that's there with esports is you can take that passion, you can take all of the good things out of it, and you can formally organize it a little bit, and you can have something that's pretty fantastic. That's just a, a short little video on kind of just the impact that we can see um, in esports and, and kind of the, the opportunities that are created by building out uh, this new sport in our schools. Um, you know, Mindy, the girl in the video there, I think is one of my favorite players I ever recruited. Um, you know, she had very little 
uh, competitive knowledge, you know, moving in, but really grew and learned over the, the few years that she was with us here at, at Jamestown and, um, you know, just had a really big passion for, for gaming and being a part of that community. Um, and it just opened so many doors. Um, you know, I talked about the scholarship side of things, um, and that's absolutely a window for more students to get a great education. Um, but it also opens doors just in the fact that we're giving students a, a place to play and a community to be a part of. Um, you know, it might not be something that these students are used to having. And I think it's a very powerful way to engage and get students to care about school in a fun way. Uh, and it opens doors to be competitive and, and have school spirit and, and actually, you know, improve a lot within just that, that school environment. Um, that's it for the slideshow. I would love for some questions to roll in. Um, I'll throw my contact info here on the screen uh, just for anybody to jot down if you still need it. I know this is kind of a shorter presentation, um, but I do want to leave, you know, 10, 15 minutes open for questions if we have them. Looks like Jeff typed out in the chat that we started our lab with STEB computers, um, but they are built a little higher. Uh, yeah, that's a great way to get started. Um, you know, you don't need sometimes to to go out and, and spend a, a ton of money on gear right off the bat. Uh, if you have existing infrastructure that is going to get the job done um, at, at that introductory level and get you started. Uh, and maybe it's something that you can do fundraising um, and moving forward to get you know, more gear or when those machines need to get refreshed, you can, you know, take a look at replacing them with, with esports built machines that also serve as, you know, STEM computers during the daytime. Uh, it's a great way to get funding for esports. Um, you know, if you go to gravitygaming.com, we have a funding and resources tab. And actually, I might be able to just pull that up here. Um, if you uh, are looking for grant resources and things like that, um, there's a ton of opportunity to receive funding um, for things like Carl Perkins VR grants or, um, you know, let's get machines for AutoCAD or, you know, high-end Adobe processing. Um, there's a lot of different opportunities to get dual purpose machines that, that work on the curriculum side in the daytime. And then all of a sudden at 3.30, we have machines that are going to run Overwatch or League of Legends at the end of the day. Um, so, it's a great way to get more for your money uh, and, you know, Certainly, Tyranny and, and Bytespeed, we're familiar with those situations and can build a config that will work for both the curriculum and the gaming side. Um, Gustavo has a question. Is there a league dedicated for middle schools at this point, or is it limited to high schools and colleges? It's a great question. Uh, and we are starting to see uh, middle school get more and more adoption across the country. Um, right now, I don't think that there's a dedicated middle school league out there. Uh, a lot of the times, you know, the, the stopping point is like that age 13 um, and up is kind of how the, the nationwide leagues or statewide leagues form just because of the, the ratings of the games. Um, you know, the ESRB on a game is like, you know, E for everyone or T for teen or, you know, M for mature, or whatever it might be. Um, the nationwide and statewide leagues oftentimes are only playing games that are um, E for everyone or T for teen. So uh, the content, of the game might be a little too uh, mature for uh, a middle schooler, um, but you know is more appropriate for somebody in high school. That's kind of one of the big determining factors right now. But I do know that there are movements happening to start more opportunities in middle school for competition. You know, Rocket League is a great example of this. It's soccer with rocket cars. Um, you know, so it's a, a great eSport to not only get into because it's easy to understand, but it's also a very content safe game that we can give to our, our younger students to be able to participate in. And it's also super popular um, and really, really fun to watch and play. So it's a great opportunity for middle schoolers um, to, to jump in. Um, you know, if you've ever heard of Steve Isaacs before, he's a, a middle school teacher out in New Jersey who does a ton of curriculum-based work with esports. Um, 
you know, things like creating Rube Goldberg machines in Fortnite, or, uh, you know, he's got different classes um, centered around Minecraft and things like that. Um, so it, it, there is an opportunity to really get invested at the middle school level. Uh, and I, it's becoming more and more popular as the years go by. Uh, and I think it's probably our next big expansion it will happen at the middle school level. Uh, we had a question come in from Brent. Uh, what are you seeing as the biggest competition games right now to draw students? My students are saying Overwatch, League of Legends, and Super Smash. Those definitely are uh, three of the top games out there. Uh, depends on where you're at, um, but League of Legends is the most popular esport in the world. Um, you know, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of players just casually uh, in their spare time. Um, it's the largest high school and collegiate esport out there that's sanctioned uh, or, you know, played under a competitive ruling. Um, you know, absolutely is one of the most popular games out there. Um, League of Legends is followed, I would say, at the high school level by Rocket League. Um, and then, you know, yes, you have Smash and uh, Overwatch kind of right there as well. Um, you know, at the collegiate level, very, very similar. Um, you know, League is at the top. Overwatch would probably be you, you like your number two. And then you have things like um, Counter-Strike, Super Smash Brothers, uh, Rocket League, all following. So, um, you know, I, I think if you're going to look at a couple of titles to start with in your school, um, especially at a high school, the safe ones and, and the ones that you will definitely get student buy-in with would be League of Legends, Rocket League, and Super Smash Brothers. Any other questions that uh, you guys have for me this morning? Is there a place for console gamers in competitive esports, or is it limited to PCs? Uh, Gustavo, great question again. Um, so th this is a, a growing portion of esports right now. Um, the majority of things have happened uh, traditionally on PC, uh, and the reason for that is, uh, you know, not all esports are built for console. Um, so like League of Legends, for example, is a PC only game. Um, you know, that is going to, if you're going to compete in League of Legends, you're going to need a computer. And then if you have a computer already, now you have a machine that's going to run, you know, other traditional esports titles. Um, if you start with a PS4 or an Xbox, sure, I can play Rocket League or, or Overwatch, but I, I might not have access to some of the other titles that are super popular. Um, however, with things like crossplay, uh, that's getting more and more um, popular, more competitive overall. Um, the experience is, is changing. Um, there is opportunities for consoles to start making their way into the esports space. Um, you know, you have games like Super Smash Brothers, super popular game, uh, is only on a console. So you have to have a Nintendo Switch to be able to play Super Smash Brothers. Um, so there's this kind of interesting look on two sides of the coin. Um, I, I would say the majority of competition will happen on a PC. Um, you just get more bang for your buck out of a, out of a computer um, when it comes to the number of titles that you can compete in. Uh, and kind of the best competitive experience oftentimes will come on a PC as well. Um, just with the refresh rates that you can get out of a monitor and a graphics card um, will, will more often than not beat what your average console can pump out. Um, so in a competitive environment where, um, you know, frames matter, and I'm going to have an advantage if I can get to 144 hertz versus, you know, 90 hertz on a console or, or something like that. Um, so there's a couple of different reasons why, uh, but that is changing. Um, at the collegiate level, the National Junior College Athletic Association uh, actually ran some console tournaments uh, in games like Madden and FIFA. Um, so, you know, we are starting to see more console only titles up here. And at the end of the day, the other thing to remember too, is that you can have a team in your school, um, you know, if you have a ton of students interested in a game that's on console, um, you might be able to just run something like an intramural style league just within your school. Um, you know, you might not be able to find a team 
that's you know wanting to play in your district or, or in your your county or your state um, but you might be able to just have like individual competition after school and, and provide an opportunity there to get involved with some students that you know might not be interested in playing League of Legends or might not own a computer or you know maybe your school doesn't have access to a ton of machines um, it's another way to get students involved uh, a couple other questions here. Can you talk about Discord and how you allow that just for your gamers and not during the school day? Uh, yeah, Eric, great question. Um, you know, Discord is part of the software package for esports that you really have to look at um, and get your IT team involved early. Um, you know, a lot of schools will handle access to the gaming software very differently. But at the end of the day, your district probably has a firewall in place that's going to block it. Um, and you know, you'll have to look at access to Discord, to League of Legends, the game, uh, you know, just for example, during certain times throughout the day, or maybe it's certain computers that you have that um, have special access through your firewall. And then really it's up to, you know, the teachers and the coach at the school to really um, kind of harp on and, and make the expectations known that, you know, we're not going to be using this during school. It's not going to be a distraction in our classroom. It is for esports use only. Um, and that way too, you can kind of monitor the traffic that happens there, monitor the posts, make sure that there's no inappropriate content being posted or, you know, no things like bullying happening behind the scenes um, because it is a social network. Um, and there are, you know, the same kind of thought processes about, you know, you know, districts might've had about Facebook and Twitter back, you know, when those platforms first came out, you know, you'll have to take a look at the same type of considerations for Discord. Um, but I would say a lot of schools will just have their IT staff um, make sure that Discord is blocked along with the other software, you know, like the actual game until a certain time during the day, or maybe it's, you know, the coach has an admin password that can unlock it um, when practice starts. There's a lot of different ways to handle that, but yeah, it's definitely, um, important to make sure that uh, the students know that this is for um, esports use only. So, okay, Brent has a question, desktops or laptops? I would think desktops would be better and more versatile. What do you see? Um, so this is kind of a, a case by case basis. Um, I will say that desktop performance wise will always be better. Um, just because we can get full size parts in a desktop uh, and laptops might not always have that capability. You can also get things like extra cooling. Um, you know, sometimes you're limited in a, in a laptop on how much RAM you can stick in them, um, you know, how many slots they have available, how much memory can we put in there. Um, there are some good esports laptops out there, um, you know, some good gaming laptops. They are usually more expensive too uh, than a desktop. Just, you know, that's what you're getting out of a mobile product versus, uh, you know, a standalone product. But um, performance wise, you're going to see a, an edge to most desktops, um, but they do have the drawback of being mostly stationary. Um, if you are in a school where, you know, space is limited and you don't have the ability to have, you know, 10 desktops sitting out in a lab or a classroom and, and you know, we can't move them. Or, uh, maybe you don't have that ability. Um, you know, 10 laptops that you can store in a library or pull out from the media specialist or whatever um, gives you the flexibility to be able to use space that's not always just for esports or just for, you know, a computer lab. Um, and there are schools that are in those situations where they have a, a fully mobile esports setup and laptops are just the better fit. Um, we, we have a, a laptop that we launched here at Bytespeed back in March. Um, that is, I think the best gaming laptop I've ever personally used. Um, it's got, you know, Intel's newest, um, it's kind of Intel's newest baby uh, that we're able to build in and, and 
get out there. And I, I think it's a really good solution for, you know, schools that need a mobile product just based on uh, facility restraints or, or things like that. Um, if you're doing a lot of traveling with your team too, um, if somebody's ever been to a bring your own console event, um, lugging around a desktop is not a fun project. <laughs> Carrying a laptop uh, is a lot easier. Um, but I would say the majority of schools will go with desktops. Um, and then, you know, we're starting to see very niche cases where laptops will come into play. Uh, Eric's got a question. I guess that leads to another question. Do you recommend dual booting computers that are used for Adobe and CAD during the day with gaming after school? What are best practices to get that done? Um, so, <sighs> I would say if you're looking for the best bang for your buck, getting a dual purpose computer that can be used for curriculum is absolutely the way to go. Um, you know, if you have uh, an existing lab that needs to get refreshed, it might be worth looking at, you know, looking at, you know, quote unquote esports computers uh, and having them with the hardware that it requires to run, you know, something like an Overwatch or Rocket League, but then talking with your hardware provider, you know, talking with Tierney Brothers, talking with Bytespeed about what your other uses for your machines are. And then, you know, you can kind of customize the build based on what your use case is. Um, but if you can spend, you know, thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars on a machine and you can use it for eight hours a day instead of two hours a day, um, you're definitely getting more out of your machine if you can use it for things like AutoCAD or, or um, you know, Adobe. So I, I would say it's the best use of your money is to use it for dual purpose. Um, you do have to make sure that the maintenance is kept up uh, and that you're, you know, taking a little bit more care just because you're using them more throughout the day, um, more chances for things to get bogged down or, um, you know, the hardware to deteriorate just because of, of use. Um, so you do have to kind of weigh those factors out, but I would say there's a, probably a good 50, 50 split with the schools that Bytespeed has worked with that are using the machines for more than just esports. Any other questions? These are great guys. Keep them coming. We still have 10 minutes or so. If there are more, um, you know, we'll keep things open and, and keep them coming if you have them. Real quickly, uh, well, while you guys are typing up your next questions, I do want to give a huge shout out to Tierney Brothers. Um, they've been a great partner as far as, you know, helping us grow uh, esports in, in the U.S. Um, you know, we're really excited about working with them and kind of moving forward on the solutions that, that you know, they're looking to help implement into schools. They've been a great partner. Um, we've been kind of working on this esports venture with them for about a year now. Uh, and we have nothing but good things to say about that group. And we just want to give them a special shout out this morning. Um, you know, thanks for your partnership. Thanks for being, you know, awesome to, to walk alongside with. Uh, we're really excited about kind of where things are going to head in the next especially in the next year and beyond. Um, so Gustavo, you mentioned Super Smash Brothers is getting more popular as a console game. Which version of the game would you say is the most popular at this point if schools were looking to compete? Um, definitely Super Smash Brothers Ultimate, the most recent one that's on the uh, Nintendo Switch. Um, that is kind of the, you know, and if you're looking at the professional scene, you know, yes, Melee is super popular still. Um, that's the GameCube title from years back. Um, you know, there's still a small group that's playing things like Smash 4. But um, as far as like what you want to look at for your high school uh, to compete in, it's definitely Super Smash Brothers Ultimate for the Nintendo Switch. Any other questions? 
which games are best for middle school? Okay, Angie, great question. Um, so if you're going to look at games for middle school, first one right off the bat that you absolutely want to look at is Rocket League. Um, it's soccer with rocket cars. Um, you, you can't get much safer uh, on the content side than that. Um, and definitely is a, a massively popular esport out there. Um, you know, it's got a great collegiate scene. It's got a good pro scene. Um, and there's definitely... Uh, a need for more Rocket League players out there. And it's super fun just beyond, you know, the the viability in the middle school space. It's just a fun game. Uh, and watching high level Rocket League is is definitely an awesome thing to, to see. Um, so I, I would start with that. And then you can look at things like, um, you know, potentially League of Legends, um, you know, depending on your stance at the school, um, you know, like I said, Steve Isaacs out in New Jersey is using Fortnite to do more curriculum based stuff. Um, not necessarily like high level competitive esports, uh, but is using it in the classroom. Um, you know, also kind of goes with Minecraft. Uh, I don't know if I would consider Minecraft an esport necessarily, but it is um, instructionally a, a game that you can use with middle schoolers that they're going to be excited to play uh, in the classroom and, and, you know, get a little bit more out of that software than just like, Oh, Hey, you know, we're going to build, build with blocks. Um, but I would say rocket league for sure. And then super smash brothers is kind of the other really content safe one. It is a fighting game, but it's, it's developed by Nintendo. It's a family friendly game. Um, and I would say rocket league and smash are kind of the two spots where I would look. Any other questions? Okay, I'm not seeing anything come through. So uh, I just want to say again, thank you, everyone for attending today. Um, thanks for all your great questions. Love the back and forth. Uh, I hope you learned something. Uh, and certainly if you have questions or, or need things answered that you know, you might think of later today or tomorrow or over the summer, feel free to reach back out um, to myself or um, Tierney brothers, you know, get in touch with your rep. Uh, we're definitely excited to, to give you the resources and the help you need. Uh, and, you know, again, shout out to Tierney for helping to host and push attendance and everything for this. So thanks everybody. Stay safe. We'll talk to y'all soon.